Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming and spending a few moments with me today. It's been an interesting <coughs> morning for me. I was up at about five o'clock and I flew into Glasgow this morning from Birmingham after dropping my car off at the airport. I then jumped on a shuttle bus and then a train. So I've had the pleasure of being in a car, a plane, a bus, and a train. Train, plane, and automobiles. That's the one. Train, planes, and automobiles. Brilliant. And I speak to my wife earlier today, so the only thing you haven't done is go on a boat. So if anybody has a boat here, <laughs> I'm more than happy to go for a ride for you. In fact, I think my hotel's across the river, so maybe I'll just row across to it, just complete the package, if you like. So my background is that for nearly 20 years, I supplied decorative lighting to independent retailers around the country. And the one thing that always amazed me and I could never quite understand how you could get two retailers who could generate vastly different sums of money. And I remember visiting a showroom down in Bournemouth, beautiful showroom, huge frontage, wonderful window displays, lovely products, great location, busy, busy uh, uh, traffic going past. And yet they hardly made any money. The, the margins were just minimal and then I'd find myself in another part of the country and I'd visit a, a showroom down the side street and nice products nice people and the turnover was just going through the roof never quite could understand it so I asked myself the question which you may ask yourself this question as well how is it possible that one retailer can generate twice as much turnover with the same resources and opportunities as the nearest competitor. How is it that two retailers can generate vastly different sums of money, even though they may have sometimes the same products or very similar products, similar opportunities, sometimes it's the same size showroom, and yet one is doing much, much more than the other one. Then I'll kind of ask the next question, the next logical question which might be on your mind, that if we can understand what the high performing retailer is doing and then duplicate those principles into your business, then surely you're going to get the same results. Does that make sense? Would you agree with that? Okay. So my dad was in retail all of his life and he was really well known for transforming failing stores into successful outlets when he worked for a large organization. And I had the privilege of working with him for five years in my early career. And he was very talented. I can remember he was really good with the staff. He would inspire the staff to do things that they didn't think were possible. He had difficult staff, easy staff, but he just had this way of inspiring them uh, to work well. He was also very good with customers. And he just had a way of, of, of working with customers that they, they wanted to buy from him. So he's an extremely talented and very experienced uh, man. And, and it's no wonder he did well when he worked for a large organization. And the interesting thing is that when he went into his own retail business, he really struggled. In fact, he tried three different retail outlets and each time he, he really struggled. And I wonder what happened. Did he suddenly lose all of those talents and skills that he had? Did he suddenly forget everything he'd learned all those years? Hmm. And it was over time that I came to realize that the key difference or the major uh, challenge that my dad had, maybe he missed in this particular instance, that he was either unable to, or perhaps he didn't know how, to identify, clearly identify, and communicate his value to the marketplace in a way that they'd pay him well for his expertise. Okay? The fundamental difference between the two retailers in my earlier example is value. One retailer is delivering twice as much value as the other <coughs> retailer. So it makes sense then that if we want to increase our turnover, 
we need to increase our value because value is everything. In fact, the first uh, lesson in economics that I learned was that we get paid primarily for value. That's it. They get paid for your time. You don't have to work more hours of what you're doing. You just need to increase your value. And when I talk about value, I'm not talking about the value of the products in the showroom, or the, or the showroom itself, or having a really nice stylish website, those things are obviously important. And most retailers that I deal with, I do, they do a pretty good job of that. So we're really talking about increasing your personal value to the marketplace so that you can get paid more for your expertise. That's really what's fundamental between the two different retailers. If we can clearly identify your value and then communicate it in such a way that customers recognize your value, you're going to get paid more than you're currently getting paid. Does that make sense? Would I agree with that? Okay. Because, as Casey Brown says, no one will ever pay you what you're worth. That's the reality of life. That's the sad reality or the happy reality, however you want to look at it. No one will ever pay you what you're worth. They'll only ever pay you what they think you're worth. And the good news is that you control the thinking. And the way you control the thinking is by clearly identifying and communicating your value to the marketplace so that you get paid well for your expertise. From my experience, most of the retailers I'm talking about independent retailers that I have met, and I've met hundreds and hundreds of them all around the country, are very good at what they do. And I don't think there's any exception here. They know their stuff, they're experts, they're passionate about what they do. The fundamental flaw that I see is that they struggle to communicate that to the marketplace that they're willing to pay them. So yeah, I like what you're telling me, I'm not going to haggle. I'm not going to get into a whole discounting fight. I'm going to buy from you. So how do we do that? So, how do you then identify and communicate your value to the marketplace? How do you do that? We're going to talk about that a little bit in a moment. So my background is that I'm a retail coach. I'm also the author of this book, David and Goliath, How Independent Retailers Can Take on the Giants and Win. And typically I work with retailers who've been, they're established, they've been around maybe five or six years, they've got a nice business, uh, they're doing well, they've got a nice concept, but they're trying to get it to the next level. They're trying to bat away all of these internet shoppers, which I'm sure you get from time to time, probably every day. And so they're willing to learn, they've got some skill sets that they're trying to put into the business, and they're happy to work with an external coach. When I go around the country, I, I get um, lots of questions, lots of questions from retailers. I get hundreds of questions. So many that I just wrote some of them down. And see if you identify with any of these questions, if they sound familiar, okay? The kind of questions they ask me is, how can I sell more products at a sensible price? Is that something that would be of interest, okay? How can I spend more time selling high value products very often we find retailers, it's, a, it, it's, it's part of the trade that you can spend a lot of time with someone who spends 10 pounds or 40 pounds or whatever it is. So how do, we, how do we not get rid of them, but get more customers who are willing to pay a bit more with you, you know, and, and value your expertise and uh, spend a bit more time with you? How do I make the margins that I used to make? How can I train my staff? How do I handle conflict resolution? That was an interesting one. I had a business in Birmingham who his staff just didn't know how to handle complaints. <laughs> and so the customer would get angry and the staff would get angry and there was this fuming tirade going on in the shop. we we'll try and deal with that. How can I compete with the internet? Big problem. Sometimes I'll ask, who are you? Who am I? What's my background? How am I going to help them? What's included in the training? What's excluded? How do you measure results? Will you be training my staff? How much will it cost? How long will it take? Does my methodology work? And the reason they're speaking to me is because if they knew how to fix the problem, they would have done it already, okay? And that's the reason that we get together and we have a chat. 
we try to work things out. Now, I can answer all of those questions, given time, which I don't have time to do it right now, but I can share with you the answers to three of the most common questions that I get. These are the ones that just keep coming over and over and over again. The first one is, how can I get my business to run smoothly? How can I get it to run in a way that I just wake up in the morning with like a smoothly running engine, everything's well oiled and it's just working nicely? How can I get that to happen? The second thing is, how can I maintain a decent turnover with sensible margins? There's no point in having really nice turnover if your margins are so tight that you're not earning anything out of it. And this is something that worries me, and I'm sure it does you, that particularly bricks and mortar retailers are having a challenge with. And then the last question I get, which I find really interesting, is how can my business deliver the lifestyle that I want? Because let's face it, most retailers have gone into retail, had some kind of an idea of what kind of lifestyle they want. They want the business to deliver a certain kind of income stream so that you can do the things that are exciting to you and important to you. <clears throat> so those are the questions. But for this to happen, there are three things that have to be in place. In order for these three questions to be answered, the first thing that needs to make happen is that you need to have the right customers. So in other words, you need to know who your target audience is. It's really, really cr cr critical that you get a very specific, clear idea, definition of who your ideal customer is. Second, you want to make sure that you have the right product mix so that your products appeal to your target audience, not just to anybody who's walking, walking through the door. And then lastly, we need to make sure that you're, you've identified your skill sets and you're communicating your value to the marketplace, your personal value to the marketplace, so that it makes a real difference. This morning, uh, there was uh, Rene speaking from, it was a social media company, I can't remember the company, uh, and he spoke about how critical it is for retailers to bring the personality to social media, not the products, because people don't buy products on social media, they buy you and he spoke about that this morning. So those are things that need to happen, but what usually happens is we try to be all things to all people, so then it's very difficult for, for customers to differentiate you from, from other people, from your competitors. Uh, we have uh, maybe, maybe the same or similar product as everyone else, products and services, and then we tend to be a free sounding board. I've seen this with really good friends of mine, and it's really sad, and it happens over and over again, where customers come in, they'll spend, it, especially if it's uh, items that require a little bit of um, help and advice, they can spend one, two, three hours in, in a showroom sometimes, they don't get paid for it, which wouldn't be so bad if they bought the product from the shop, but sometimes they don't. They whip out their mobile phone and they do a price check, don't they? And then they click, can you match that? Or if you can't, I'm gonna buy it somewhere else. That's a real battle real battle. So, getting back to these three points, all three of these elements must be in place before this is going to work. Okay, so for example, you could have the right customers, you may well have the right product mix, but perhaps you're not communicating your value to the marketplace. And so what happens is the wrong customers are coming into the store and the right customers are shopping somewhere else because they don't know about it. You may well have the right customers, you've identified and communicated your value to the marketplace, but you've got the wrong products. The problem with that is you're getting the right customers in the door, but you haven't got what they want, so they're not buying from you. And that becomes a problem. Or you might have uh, the right products, and you've identified and communicated your value, but you've got the wrong customers coming through the door. And they're not going to buy from you because they don't value your expertise. They don't value what you're offering them. And so they tend to kind of uh, lose interest and disappear. So during my research, I discovered that the top retailers in this country, and this is the nationals as well as the six, what I would call successful independent retailers, they all did seven things repeatedly. And they did these things over and over again that made them successful. And what I found is that when I speak to retailers, most of them are doing you know, a fair chunk of these seven things already. And so I very rarely come across someone who's not doing at least some of it. But it is that 
one principle, that maybe that one idea that you've come here today to listen to, might be just that one principle that's missing in your equation that's preventing you from getting to the next step. And it's usually the one that we avoid, the one that's most difficult to do. So let's have a look and see if, it's, if you can spot if there's any, the, the one thing, it might be a couple of things that maybe you're not quite getting it right. And how do we get that right? And I call them the seven success secrets of high performing retailers. And you've got to ask the question, why did I call it the seven success secrets? Because surely this information is so readily available. You can find it on the internet. We're in the information age. If you really worked hard enough, you'd really find what these secrets are. The reason I called them the seven success secrets is that last year at the Autumn Fair in Birmingham, I was speaking on the same stage as Theopathetus from Dragon's Den. We had a Dragon's Den event here earlier on. And I wasn't at the same time, clearly, but we were on the same stage. And when I was getting mic'd up, I was speaking to the sound engineer and I said, how have the talks been going for the last three or four days? He said, oh, really good, really good. He said, but it's interesting that of all the speakers that have spoken at this event, the person that I learned least from was Theo. And I wondered, why was that? And it wasn't that Theo wasn't an inspiring speaker. He drew a huge crowd. People were hanging on his every word. He's inspirational. We know him from the television, he's a multimillionaire, so people wanted to hear what he had to say. The problem was that he was not able to communicate those principles that made him successful in such a way that the audience could walk away and go, ah, if I do this, this, and this, like Theo did, I'm gonna be successful. Either like Theo, or at least I'll be going in the right direction. He wasn't able to do that. And that's what I found quite interesting with very, very successful people, that very often they don't really know what made them successful in the first place. It was only when I read Theo's biography that I realized that actually I could unpick these principles and the seven success secrets are gonna come up on the board any moment. And that's why I call it a secret, because sometimes things are so obvious that we don't see it. But the very first thing, the very, very critical thing is to make sure that you have a, a picture of the lifestyle that you want. In other words, I dare you to dream and to dream big and to start thinking about where you want the business to go, what you want it to achieve, and then what kind of lifestyle do you want to get from that business? And more importantly, write it down. If it stays up here, it just kind of stays up in the cloud and it just, nothing happens. The minute you start writing it down, something magical starts to happen. You start to believe it. Even better, if you can get some pictures or some images or the more tangible things that you want, get those as well. I've done that in my life. These seven principles are the principles that I applied in my life. And I had a picture book with the kind of house I wanted and the car and the places I wanted to go. Uh, and once I did that, all of these things started to fall into place. The second part of the process is it's really important to develop a clear sense of purpose. Okay, again, this is what I found top retailers do uh, and top businessmen and entrepreneurs around the country is they know where they're headed. And there's three things that I discovered is that they knew they had a vision for the future, they had, a, they had goals, in other words, an action plan, and they had the reason. They knew why they were doing it in the first place. That's what I found fascinating. And having a vision is not about looking to the future with rose-tinted glasses, it's about looking to the future with reality, having a reality check. Is if I carry on doing what I'm currently doing, what's gonna to happen to me and my business in the next three to five years? I was with a lovely couple in Birmingham two weeks ago, and they've got a lovely business, they've been around for six or seven years, but their sales are down 20%. And they're just hanging on and hoping and hoping and praying that things are gonna change. And when I said, well, where's the business gonna be in three years, in five years' time? It was not a pretty sight, you know, and the business uh, highly unlikely to be around unless we make changes. So it's really having a reality check. When we talk about goals, it's, it's putting action plans into place. It's turning those dreams into reality. And this is what I found, again, in, in my own life and with retailers around the country, the ones that they did well had a plan. The next part of the process is you've really got to enjoy what you're doing. If you don't love what you're doing, then you might want to think about doing something else, dare I say. Now at this point, most of you will fall into two groups. 
One group will be people who say, I really love what I'm doing, which is great. And the others will be, I used to love what I'm doing, but I don't enjoy it now. Or maybe there's something happening, you've fallen out of love with your business. Let me just speak to the first group first, whoever you are. And that is um, a bit of a stress test question, if you like. Uh, because sometimes we'll say we love what we're doing, but we're only just saying that because we think that's what other people want to hear. And the question you may want to ask yourself is that if you didn't have to earn money, would you, car would you carry on doing what you're currently doing? If you didn't have to earn money, would you, currently, would you carry on doing what you're currently doing? Just ask yourself that question and if, reflect on, on that. To the other group, if you've fallen out of love with what you are currently doing, um, there is hope, okay? And I would invite you to ask this question. The question really is, um, how can I help other people, when I say other people, talking about your staff and your customers, love what you do? Because the minute you take the focus off of yourself and onto your customers and your staff, a strange thing starts to happen. You start really enjoying what you're doing because there's nothing better than watching other people get really excited about what you're doing. Again, this is something that I found that top retailers do. They, they really do enjoy what they're doing because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not going to pay the price that you need to pay in order to succeed in your business. Really important to become a highly valued retailer. And by that, people are talking about you. They're talking about you on social media. They're talking about you uh, in, in, in the neighborhood, in your community. And they're saying, yeah, if you want good service, go to so-and-so down the road. If you want good advice, they're going to help you. And very often, they're happy to pay whatever you are charging them, within reason, obviously, within reason. Uh, one man who understood this principle is a good friend of mine, Rob James. He owns an interiors design store in Chandler's Ford. And like many of you, he had this problem with customers coming into the store and knocking him down on prices, and the margins were going down and down and down, until he decided to take a look at his personal value, and he decided, wait a minute, what have I got here that I can utilize? And he's an interior designer, and that's what he does. And so he decided that he would offer a free service, go into the homes of his customers, and offer a free interior design service. And business started to pick up. After a few months, he charged an 85 pound call out fee, non-refundable, and they paid. About six months later, he created a full lighting design service for these huge big houses where he lives. He charged 750 pounds for that service. That's without products or anything else. And they paid. Shortly after that, an expert in the industry came up to Rob and said, you're undercharging, can you believe that? He said, you are undercharging. And literally, he was telling me last year when I was in Birmingham, he doubled his fee to 1,500 pound overnight, and they paid. You see, one of the fundamental reasons, as we said earlier on, that people will pay you what they're paying you is because that's what they value you at. But I believe that each one of you are worth a lot more, perhaps, than you're currently getting paid. But it's about communicating that value to the marketplace that they are willing to pay you for your products and services. The next thing I found interesting was with really good retailers that they give exceptional service. And we're not talking about good service, and that is the standard. Most retailers give good service, and they're very good at that. But really, it's about uh, offering exceptional service. In other words, going the extra mile, doing the things that, that you wouldn't normally do, doing things that customers, are, it's unexpected. They don't expect you to do this. You've gone the extra mile. Now, here's the caution. You cannot give exceptional service <laughs> to everybody. Because if you try that, you'll go out of business. And that's why it's so crucial to know who your target audience is. And have a really clear definition of who your target audience is. Because everything you do will be aimed at your target audience. And that's okay if other people come in, you know, the price checkers and the discounters, that's fine, they can still come through the door. We're not gonna get rid of them. What we're gonna do is gonna increase the amount of nice ideal customers. We've all had nice customers come through the door. We just need to get more of them. And the closer you get to your target audience, this is an interesting 
economics, the higher the value of your customer. The closer we get to your target audience, the higher the value. In other words, they, when they come in, they start buying in bulk. Or, you know, they don't, they don't buy little bits here and there. They start, they, they like you. They like dealing with you. And they like being in your store. And they're less likely to haggle over price. This is the target audience. Everything uh, that the top retailers do is that they aim at the center. So they're not ignoring the other customers. They're just aiming at the center there. And so your target customer isn't your only customer, if that makes sense, okay? But in order to get more of them, we need to target them. Now, for all of these five things to work, the next ingredient is absolutely critical because if we don't get this right, everything else is gonna fall like a pack of cards. And that is developing the art of self-discipline. And this is often a struggle for all of us. We all struggle with self-discipline. We get an idea, we think we're gonna give it a go, and then we struggle with it. Last week I, I was speaking in Exeter, and this young lady came up to me afterwards. She's starting out a new retail business, and she was just asking for some advice. And it came, it came down to it, she realized that actually the way she could get more customers is by learning to do public speaking, to speak in groups in her community. But she was so terrified of doing that, that literally as she was standing there, she told me, she said, my, her nose started to, 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 to not bleed, but to sort of twitch. Um, and she was shaking a little bit, and that was just thinking about it. And then I asked her, well, how many of your competitors do you think are doing what you're doing? And the answer is either none or hardly anybody. And so if she was able to, exercise of self-discipline and master that skill, what would happen to her business? All of a sudden she starts to become very valuable. So I'm just wondering, what, what are you avoiding? What are, what are some of the things that you know, and you probably know it already, what are some of the things that you could be doing, or that one thing that may cause you to step out of your comfort zone? It may require asking for help, going to Toastmasters in this particular instance, or uh, just trying it yourself. So we need to master the art of why does, for example, why do uh, companies like uh, Slimming World and Weight Watchers do so well? Why are they such a successful business? Have they found some magical formula, some magical recipe that nobody else knows about? Well, of course not. The only reason they're so successful is because they help their clients to exercise or to master the art of self-discipline. You know, every week you've got to weigh in, they give them goals and targets, they're going to check them out. When I wrote my book, I've been trying to write my book for years, it was only when I engaged a publisher, and I went to a publishing group, and I worked with some other people who are writing books as well, that I learned how to become self-disciplined in writing a book, and I managed to do that within a year while working at the same time. But I hadn't ever written a book before. And then the last thing, which is very closely linked to uh, self-discipline, is persistence. Nothing ever happens until you persist through. And I wish there was another way. I wish there was a way I could say, here's the shortcut, don't need to persist, just do this and you'll get what you want. But it does require persistence. Every great invention, every great scientific discovery, and every great retailer has become great because they've persisted through those dark nights when it's become difficult and they've stuck at it and they've remained uh, where, they, where they should. So those are the seven key principles uh, that we are sharing. So hopefully, I know you might stop thinking about that idea, that concept, and maybe if you applied that. There's a book, anybody heard of the book called The Tipping Point by Malcolm Glad Gladstone, Canfield, I think? The Tipping Point, it's an excellent book. He talks about how it's very often just that one little extra step, that if we worked on that, that the tipping point takes us over from becoming a good retailer to an exceptional retailer. Uh, workshop is, we're going to introduce you to our five-step methodology. And the first thing is we're going to help you with your dare to dream strategy. So we're going to really drill down and get what's really important to you and what's important to your business and to your family and how you'd like to see things change. We're then going to help you to develop an action plan so that you can achieve or at least start the process of achieving your lifestyle that's important to you. We'll help you to identify your target customer who do you want coming through that door? 
The fourth step is we're going to stress test your products and services, or well, you're going to be doing it, and we're going to be working together on that, uh, to make sure that your products are the right products for your target audience. And some, it may well be, it may well be that they are, or maybe we need to tweak it a little bit, or maybe we need to make a transformation there. And then we're going to just talk about how you can identify and communicate your value to the marketplace so that you get paid a decent amount of money for your expertise, that people highly value you and they're prepared to come in and not fuss and fight and, and fight with you. So earlier on, I mentioned my dad, and he was a very hard-working and very determined man. But sadly, he died in a car accident 30 years ago before he could turn that business around. So we never quite knew whether he was going to turn the corner at that business, uh, in the business that he had. But even though I wasn't able to be there, wasn't able to be there to help him, I mean, to be quite frankly, to be quite frank, at that time, I probably couldn't have helped him because I didn't know what I was doing. I believe that if we work together, that we can help to transform your business into the kind of business that will provide you with the kind of lifestyle that's really important to you. And, and quite frankly, I think one that you deserve. And we get to a point where the community starts valuing you, uh, the your customers start to value you, and there's, there's less of this sort of haggling about price and value. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. If you have any questions, um, then I'm here to answer those questions. Or if you want to come up and have a chat to me about the workshop, you're more than welcome to do so as well. Thank you very much.